general picture on that. Um, arm milestones. I mean the arm is this this thing which I think most people will have some knowledge of uh, the last few months. It hit, it hit the press because this uh, company called SoftBank came along and um, put 24 and a half billion pounds on the table for this company and uh, to be honest, most people have no idea what ARM is. And if you, if you go to a technology type community and ask them what it is, they will tell you something about it. You know, it's, um, it's a processor, it's a processor company, uh, it's a company that makes the chips that go in phones or something like that. Uh, and if you go to you know, Joe Public in the, uh, in the street, then they would never heard of it at all. So it's not like Intel. Most people have seen a little Intel Inside sticker. And so when you explain that ARM was, is the company that uh, is inside pretty well everything that's intelligent in the world, which isn't on, on a desktop, and um, then it's quite a startling thing. And most people don't understand it. So why de then? did this Japanese investment community put 24.3 billion real pounds on the table to buy ARM? And, uh, and so that, hence this, uh, let's go back and have a look at this. Well, the first thing is, uh, when you start looking at this, the ARM is much bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. And I, the only other thing I could think of that has that characteristic is a TARDIS. And most of you being techies in some way will know what a TARDIS is. Anybody not know what a TARDIS is? I'm pleased about that. You're fired, you might as well go. <laughs> <laughs> so ARM actually does very much more than, uh, than it says on the can. And so then the, looking at th through the milestones as we go through um, from its early days, then you'll start to get an idea of the things that were important in its... Um, in its formation, in its running, in, it, in the 26 years of its being. But it'll also give you an idea of the breadth of what ARM is too. So we need a timeline and it's very fortunate we have a TARDIS here because the TARDIS will enable us to leap back in time 26 years. And there we are, just like that, 26 years. Uh, 1990, the formation of ARM. Before that was, App, was uh, Acorn and the BBC home computer and all of that story, which is another story and in, in, in itself a fascinating story. But 1990 saw Advanced Risk Machines Limited spin out from Acorn Computers. And this was a spin out because um, Apple was very concerned that Acorn was its major competitor. Can you imagine that? Acorn Computers was Apple's major com competitor in the desktop market and Apple and, and uh, Acorn both considered that the IBM PC was a flash in the pan because it was way over-engineered and didn't have enough capability. Uh, it was these 12 people, Mike Muller is still on the board, the other underlying people are people who are still in the company. Um, they started up and they started up in this barn and their business model was to be what would subsequently be known as a fabulous semiconductor company. They were going to do chip designs primarily for Apple and for Acorn. These chips would go into the desktop and the laptop computers that we're thinking about for the future. And, uh, and they would be supplied from um, Acorn, sorry, they would be supplied from Apple Limited who would have them manufactured in fabs somewhere else around the world. So it's the fabulous, fabulous model. Um, the thing that both of, of these um, customers liked about ARM was it was a risk machine, it was simple, and that made it energy efficient. It wasn't a complex thing, and it gave quite a respectable uh, performance compared to the, uh, the bigger risk machines that you could buy from people like Intel and Motorola at the time, or bigger machines which not just risk machines, SIS machines as well but they all consumed huge amounts of energy to give maximum performance because they had a world where maximum performance was always the objective and these guys had started to be interested in good enough performance but higher energy efficiency. Now the other thing that they were going to do is they were thinking about uh, shipping those processes to other markets as well so 
It's not just Apple and Acorn, but the, the belief was there would be other companies that need them as well, and they would produce processes which were going to be aimed at those markets too. They wanted to see the CPU development proceed independently of Acorn and Apple, and that was a competitor-type situation. These guys didn't want either of them to be determining the, the uh, architectural evolution of the processes, so they wanted it to be done independently. And very much the last line on that turned out to be what ARM actually did. So the long-term idea of using the CPUs as cores for some kind of advanced users in an ASIC kind of context was the last thing on that list. Now you see that by 1992-93 things have changed. I'll just go back to that one for a moment though. 91, GEC Plessy Semiconductors, which was me in another company, um, licensed the first money paying license of ARM. We bought a whole lot of stuff and the rights to use it as a cell in the cell library. And the reason that we were interested in it is we, we were a semiconductor company and we at that time, this is little uh, GEC Plessy Semiconductors based down in Plymouth in the UK, we had an ASIC capability and a process geometry which was leading the world. There was nobody else who was on one micron, and we were on one micron, and our micron was smaller than the, than the one micron processes which other competitors in the world were producing at that time. So we were absolutely right up there as a leading one, and we wanted to use uh, more sophisticated cells in the cell, cell library, and so ARM with its CPUs just seemed like a logical thing for us to do. So we took a, a, took a license. So the last line item of what, of what ARM wanted to do, we wanted to do. We, that was the license that we wanted. 1992-93 then, um, by now, Newton has collapsed. Acorn is struggling. No new opportunities have come up for other companies who want to buy from us an, an optimized processor. There's copies of all of this will be available. You don't need to write it down. Okay. Uh, but it's, you can if you want to. <clears throat> so all of a sudden, that, those five line items about what ARM was going to do have become the bottom one. And actually, there wasn't really not much defined business that went along with that either. So boldly, and this is where uh, this guy called Robin Saxby, who was chairman at the time, and he was a good guy. He said, at that time, when everything was going pear-shaped, he said, we want to be the Z80 of the 90s. Now, Z80 is a, an 8-bit processor, um, and it was the um, uh, 8080 equivalent made by Zilog, I think. And it was quite popular. It was all over the place. And so he, were, here he was making a declaration that ARM was going to be global. And we're going to do this thing. ARM is going to be all over the world. And yet, the major markets... Well, what, what they had planned to do at that time had just collapsed that year. <clears throat> so to support that, they made a, an on-chip uh, bus, which is essentially, here's a processor and you can connect it to the peripherals that it needs and there's a standard way of doing so. It was a nice idea. It would support the modular concept. Trouble, trouble was it didn't work. But nevertheless, ARM continued to sell it, and customers who bought it came back and said it doesn't work, and ARM said, yes, it does. <laughs> 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 Those are fun days. We just had arguments with customers. But of course, the energy efficiency, which had been noted, um, was, turned out to be something which, which became quite an interesting marketing tool, because... Somebody at this point, while they, were, while they were struggling to find out you know, how to take this forward, how to make a real business out of this thing, um, thought, well, we could actually make rather more of the energy efficiency of this CPU core. And so somebody calculated what the MIPS per watt was of an ARM CPU on its own, an ARM 7 CPU on its own, and, uh, and it came up with a number. Now... So we knew that the processor was fairly energy efficient. And we knew what the MIPS per watt number was. But actually, nobody else had any idea what their MIPS per watt of their, performance, uh, of their processors were. So when ARM was going out and talking to, um, to customers and potential customers for the, for the technology, 
ARM was able to say, and our processes are so many MIPS per watt. What's the other, what do the other people's look like? And of course, they would go back to other people, and there was other people who were offering uh, CPUs as uh, IP even in those days. MIPS was one of them. And they would say to them, ah, yes, but what's your MIPS per watt figure? And of course, MIPS didn't have a number for that, and Intel yeah. didn't have a number for it. It wasn't that ARM was necessarily better, but ARM had a number, <laughs> and the others didn't have the number. So it turned out to be very useful because, you know, ARM is fairly energy efficient even then. Um, but it was, uh, it was always kind of um, unusual, if you like, if they'd set, sat down and actually done a measurement of those, their systems, they might have found it wasn't that noticeable. But they didn't. They just struggled. So anyway, by 1993, Plessy had become a licensee in 91. 93... TI had become a licensee. This is a major milestone. There was actually a second licensee, which is Sharp. But the thing about TI, which is interesting, is TI takes ARM into, into uh, the GSM, the mobile phone area. That's why it's a major milestone. Now, with three licenses, ARM suddenly is cash positive. It's its first profitable year, 1993. And it stays profitable every year from that point. Now, that was a large chunk of luck, if you like. Arm has lost its three major market opportunities. It's got, it's really had to go with the last string in the bow. And uh, it's managed to persuade three people to buy licenses for this. Not huge amounts of money. The licenses in those days were quite a bit cheaper than they are now. But nevertheless, when you put this together and look at the accounts, uh, they're positive, and the because they're positive, investors like you. This is a business which is making money, and it's only three years old, and it's making money. So, an obvious question. Hmm. Um, so that was three years of losing money, right? Well, they lost money up to that point, yes. How can you buy the, the company for three years? Without well, it had it had uh, the initial investors, which were Apple, and VLSI, and um, uh, Acorn. Those that put money into the business, and they ran off that for three years. Now, the, there was no external investors beyond those three in the first instance. There was another investor um, who was a... Um, I, I don't know if it's public knowledge who this was, so I didn't say it really. But there was another investor who put some of his own private money in at a couple of stages to make sure that the chips, which demonstration chips which are necessary, actually got funded. But, uh, but they were, that was essentially what it ran off. Now, at the 2000, uh, 1993, they were, at this point, if they hadn't had money, what, probably if one of those investors, one of those licensees hadn't come through, then they would have been in a negative situation. And the problem then is they wouldn't have got further investment. Because they were profitable, they did get further investment. So... Once it, once it got to that particular point, then other people came forward and wanted to put money into the business because it was clearly a business that was going somewhere. Yeah. Truth is a different thing. <laughs> it was still very much hit and miss. Anyway, 1994, living up to this uh, being the Z80 of the 90s, Arm opened its first two offices at, in the rest of the world, Tokyo and San Jose. One, one person running out of their own front room, basically. Um, these were, you know, it was a very bold thing to be doing. It hasn't really got lots of money. It's struggling. One person in each office. But the primary thing here that Robin Saxby was saying, if we're going to be successful in those regions, then we have to handle the interface into those regions with people who know the region. So in Japan, you needed to have Japanese locally. They would handle the difficulties, the cultural differences, the hour differences, uh, even the conversion rates, uh, the language differences. All of those would be handled by that person inside the company, so it wouldn't look like it was a different company on the outside. It was a master stroke. Uh, and it says, essentially, if it wanted to achieve that Z80, then it had to do that. Um, so these are... Again, fairly risky things because the, no big breakthrough has happened yet. We're still spending money. Slightly positive because there are investors who've come forward now who are hearing that it's a good idea. But we're still very much waiting for the big breakthrough to happen. 
Anyway, 1996, and this is one in red because this is uh, not specifically ARM, but it's something that happens in the outside world, and it relates to ARM. A virtual Socket Interface Alliance, VSIA, was formed by Toshiba and Cadence, joined by Mentor and Fujitsu fairly quickly, and ARM joined a year after. Essentially, Toshiba and Cadence, and I think Cadence more than anybody, had realized that um, they wanted to have cell libraries which were uh, capable of porting designs from one manufacturer, one supplier, one fab to another, and also to enable larger blocks to be used because uh, essentially the capacity of chips was getting a bit big. So reuse was becoming a major issue and they, it, they hadn't actually put it into real words in that context yet. Um, they, it as an activity failed to recognize just how, much, how quickly things were getting uh, bigger and so it focused very much on making hardware blocks and not software and eventually it folded in 2007. But other industry standards bodies emerged really to pick up specific areas and around a couple of years later that they became more significant. But the main point about it is it's the turning point at which the industry starts to become aware of the need for IP and reuse because it's too complex to try and do it all yourself anymore. So I'll deviate a little bit and I'll use this chart. And this chart goes back to 1999, so it's pretty old vintage. But the thing that's nice about it is it goes all the way down to 1981 and it's not that much of a challenge to extend it to today and it's Moore's Law on the top line. Um, the bottom line is the one, the real reason why I like it, because that's transistors per chip, but this is designer productivity. And you can see that the productivity isn't going up as quickly as the number of transistors. So a scale on that, when ARM came into being, 1990, 1991, we're talking about integrated circuits with around a million transistors on it. That was represented about 100 person years of effort to design. You could design that, you could handle that. 100 person years, a couple of years, 50 people. You know, it's, a, it's an uncomfortably large number, but you could manage it. You could start with a clean sheet of paper. You could do it all in one office or a couple of offices. But you run this out a couple of years and you end up, because these are log scales, you end up with horrendous numbers. Now that was before people that started to think about verification because the way that you checked that these things worked in the past is you looked at the outputs and you could see them going up and down and you could, you could eyeball it and you could work out that it was working. You know, it wasn't good enough. When, you got, when your systems got so complicated, you had to start looking at the higher levels. You had to start looking at uh, decomposing the design. The whole design activity became much, much more complicated. So VSIA came into being about here and it struggled on for a few years and collapsed about there. Um, and I think the, the thing that has registered with me looking back on this is in this era here, and I can include my own design efforts in this, back here I designed a chip. I designed it myself. I drew the circuit myself. I had a poor simulator. I designed the, I, I actually did the polygons on a sheet of paper. And when the chip went out to be manufactured and when it came back, I tested it with a test box. You know, that, that was possible for one person to do back then. As these design complexities grew bigger, it wasn't possible to do that. It also means that you can't do clean sheet design. You have to start doing reuse. You have to take it beyond just some hardware blocks into the software, into the hardware software, and in, really into the expertise domains as well people become expert, you can't have an expert group in every, in every company. You've got to start sharing that expertise, not just the implementation. Now, it turns out that that whole thing was exactly aligned with ARM. So ARM came into being about here, just about the time when the world was realizing that it needed IP. And actually, the world, because I, I can remember going out to, to a number of customers trying to sell the fact that we had a CPU, a block that you could use, and they would say, oh, well, we don't want to use your block. You know, CPUs are not that complicated. We'll design our own. And, and they were very much taking the attitude that they didn't need to reuse. And 
inside the company. I had another design team who was making a chip. They wouldn't use ARM. They wanted to design their own CPU, and I couldn't make them. So it's, it, this is an era when I think that what, what we failed to appreciate living through this era was what it actually means, what Moore's Law actually means. Well, it, to put the scale on it, between here and here, there is 200,000 times more transistors on an integrated circuit now. So that's 200,000 times from when ARM started to today. And that's only to design the integrated circuit. That's not to design a system in which it works. And you can't design something which is 200,000 times bigger using the same methods as used for that small something in the beginning. So anyway, I said about TI and ARM growing up. Um, Nokia brings ARM into the mobile telephony business. That was a big breakthrough for ARM. Um, it created uh, ARM7 as a product. It also created Thumb because we needed to get code into the size of ROM, which was economically viable to put into a, smart, into a basic phone, basic GSM phone. Thumb made some of the instructions 16-bit instructions. And, oh, there's a surprise. It also turns out to be good for power efficiency. Fewer instruction fetches from memory means less power <coughs> consumption. In, uh, fetching data from memory is a fairly energy intensive thing to do. So it turns out that uh, you know, this was good because this said the modular IP concept works. Uh, it takes us into the GPS market, which volume was going to be high. But I think from a, from a future potential point of view, um, the knowledge that IP is a concept, that ARM has this, this approach which can work and it enables people to use CPUs uh, in practical products suddenly opened the, uh, opened the door and licensees started flowing in. And of course, as soon as they started delivering these things, then revenue started flowing in as well. And so the IP model, at last, by 1997, was seeing a kickoff of a market which was actually going to be sustainable. And it's been sustainable ever, ever since. 1998 then, really with this knowledge, ARM did its IPO. Uh, it listed on two com in two markets, in Lon uh, London and NASDAQ in the States. Um, and these are interesting figures to remember because um, it was valued the company at 26 million. There was 350 heads and the revenue was 2.9 million for the year. Uh, and then the following year, uh, 1998, on the same year, ARM moved to Harvard Architecture. Now that's a a small point, but moving from a unified instructions and data memory to a separated data and instructions memory, it doesn't seem like a major thing. But actually, what it said was that ARM starts to recognize that some people want more performance. So this is the start of a milestone relating to performance improvements. Now, ARM, up until then, has been a, a processor, just a processor, not for major applications just for things where you might need the, the, the performance of a 32-bit machine. But the move to Harvard Architecture was the first recognition of a need for a higher performance, still not high, it's the, uh, ARM CPUs. Anyway, 1998, I joined. Now, people make up their own minds about how valuable that was, but I know it was really valuable. I was employee 376, so you can tell it's you know, not very much difference between those two. 1999. One year later, ARM enters the FTSE 100. It's one of the top, one of the biggest value companies, one of the top 100 biggest value companies in the UK. Just like that, 1999, nine years on, and it's in the list of 100 biggest companies in the UK. Now, that was good, because it says for the first time, and in fact, six months later, we dropped out. <laughs> Didn't get back in there for nearly 10 years. <clears throat> but it was quite an achievement and it got Robin Saxby his knighthood so he became a Sir Robin Saxby on the basis of that um, now there's a trail of things that follow I'm going to try and accelerate along a little bit so there's uh, 30 of, of these slides all together 2000 C System C now this is again a, blue, uh, a red activity so this is something which is outside arm 
Um, and the, the System C initiative was essentially spun out of BSIA, which is why it's important. And uh, what they were doing was recognizing the need for a, uh, a unified language which will allow the description of hardware and software concurrently. And uh, so moving a hardware and, uh, and software system modeling into a C++ environment, not the most complex thing to do, but actually declaring all of the libraries that people had been working on as open and freely available was the thing that was really valuable about it. The, 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 having done that, it created the, the demand for a pluggable fast ARM simulation model. Now, ARM had always been using simulation models, and it was, uh, they had this thing called Armulator, and when ARM was building its own CPUs, it built them around a model, and it took out the modules in that model and replaced them with hard, hardware implementations, and then ran the model. It's a very a modern way of designing things, but ARM was doing it pre-2000 using its own language and the only platforms that it had large quantities of, which were the ACORN risk machines. So it had plenty of those. Um, so this one wanted to have simulation models which were essentially pluggable. So ARM wasn't in the center of the universe anymore. The system was in the center of the universe and ARM was part of the way of delivering that system functionality. It was a milestone for that because it drove uh, ARM's development and other people's development around model-based design, which for a long time was there, but nobody was interested in doing. And the other quiet thing that happened in 2000 was ARM moved into smart cards. Smart cards had been predominantly 4-bit. They'd been very energy-constrained environments and security-conscious. So they were, the banks were very nervous about doing anything in there which was going to compromise either of those. And it was quite a breakthrough when ARM through Samsung and Incard managed to, uh, to get this thing called SC100 Secure Core, which is a, essentially a very simple 32-bit ARM machine, scrambled. So it had, uh, you moved all of the bits around, you scrambled the instructions, uh, so, no, so essentially, from the outside, you had no idea that it was an ARM processor that was in there, but it was an ARM processor. And everybody who had a smart card who wanted, would use it would have a different implementation, which is their own. So it was just, it was obs um, obfuscation. It was uh, scrambling the data rather than making it into something else. There was also some additional circuits in there to make sure that there was no current spikes. So whenever a current was drawn, when, um, in, in one cycle, and it was not drawn in the next one, you had to actually had a little piece of circuit in there to draw dummy current, so you couldn't actually spot what was going on by looking at current profiles in the system. Uh, so there was a few things there, but the, the main point was to take 32-bit functionality and put it into a smart card. And we don't notice it today, but the, the smart cards that you've got today, almost all of them are based on ARM. So 2001, um, ARM really took a, uh, a point here of moving away from just the CPU. So recognizing that DSP was a major point, so a different instruction set aimed at data processing as opposed to control processing. And also the first move away from hard cores. Up till this point, ARM had been supplying hard implementations of its CPUs aimed at specific processes. We handed over a cell people dropped it into their design and they connected it up and they used it as such. From here on, ARM has been doing synthesizable cores. Now people can choose to have hard implementations if they want to, but they can also choose the S version which is synthesizable. And that moved forward. That of course enabled people to use whatever process they wanted to use. And ARM didn't ne need to know what the process was. And some of the people who buy ARM licenses by architectural licenses, which are basically, they are totally free to implement something which, which um, uh, effectively behaves as an ARM behaves. So they look only at the API and, uh, and say, we, we would say that is an ARM by checking its conformance to the API, but the implementation detail, including the process that they use, is their business entirely. Uh, 2002, really as a result of this, 
ARM introduced system modeling, so this is now ARM's response to the System C activity. And that was, at that stage, a couple of the partners had, uh, had uh, decided that they needed to have it. And other partners, once, once it had become apparent what they were able to do with it, wanted to do it as well. Uh, Trust Zone 2003. Trust Zone is the, um, the level below the supervisor mode because uh, operating systems which previously to about here people have been saying for embedded processes we didn't need operating systems these are bare metal tools but by the time we started to talk about bringing co putting complex systems together synthesizable CPUs wanting to put substantial amounts of software on there it's increasingly difficult to do it without an operating system operating systems had, had proven to be unreliable in, especially in an embed, embedded environment but uh, in things like Windows still suffers from the same problem extensions which are dropped into the operating system are security hazards and so ARM introduced a trusted execution zone a, 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 a mode which is below uh, the uh, supervisor mode essentially where only a secure kernel can access the things which are in there and that secure kernel was developed in conjunction with the banks and in conjunction with a security company whose name I can't remember and I haven't put on the slide uh, so that is a relatively small patch of um, code but it essentially defines things which even the operating system can't touch and that enables um, things like um, the iPhone these days to have the uh, the smart card interface so you can wave your phone at a, uh, at a payment terminal so trust zone is now um, in all of the um, CPUs that that arm ship but actually it's been developed it started in development in 2003 it's taken that long for these things to actually make their way into end product systems now prime X is system templates this is really an extension of that as well because these systems are getting really rather complicated and it's difficult to put them together and so ARM was having to create tools to assemble them so to, to put together all of the particular processes that you wanted to incorporate the peripherals that you needed and to link it into a software design environment so you could oh, and to bring the operating system and port that into it as well and configure it so that you can just write software to make it work um, and so that, as a major design activity, uh, went on inside ARM and again for a long time didn't really make it um, because the customers weren't seeing that they needed it immediately and yet it's part of the, if you like, the, the, the bits of the iceberg which are below the water level. 2004, quite a strange thing for ARM, ARM went into cell libraries cell libraries of course are the uh, the two input NAND gates and NOR gates and sort of memory compilers and uh, fairly basic physical structures and ARM has no fab don't make anything don't know end product chips why on earth do we want to get into cell libraries and I can hear myself saying that that seemed to be a totally off the wall idea and yet it turns out to have been a very smart move because the thing that we sell is synthesizable cores what you're doing here is you're giving you giving yourself an opportunity to tune those synthesizable cores for particular processes so we produce cells in or arm produce cells in this area which are optimized towards arm so you can produce some really good uh, synthesis uh, uh, outcomes of the arm processes and we were producing synthesis scripts and so on uh, which are really optimized so you're getting high performance in your implementations that again again turned out to be a major thing because the other thing it did was to bring us into contact with the fabs the fabs don't like making cell libraries they make they, they do chemistry they're photochemists that's their expertise and so arm said we will design the cell libraries that you need to do your process development and bring up and so all of, all of that activity and the, the fabs believers and the fabs used it stemmed from 2004, an investment. It's, a, it's an investment in something which seemed to be uh, angular to, to, Mames, to ARM's business. Anyway, by 2004, 
the shipments of ARM technology had reached 1.2 billion per year. Interestingly, and yet the total had only the total of all all arms that have ever been shipped at that point was still two billion. So you can see, we shipped 1.2 billion in the last year. There was only 800 million shipped ever before that year. So there's fairly steep ramp. Um, arm head count now, for the record, had reached a thousand. Revenue was 150 million. Not bad up from 2.9. These figures. R&D percentage in particular is very interesting. That is very high. 35% of revenue is spent on R&D. But you can start to see all the things that are having to be supported now. This is a large swathe of things which have started off and they all have to be pushed forward. Customers are expecting them. The three offices have become 22 and we're present in 10 countries. <coughs> Anyway, this idea of a small low power processor has become very important and so ARM is focusing very much on keeping its designs as en energy efficient and as high performing as possible. They are pressurized to have more and more performance. But one of the things that comes about is that small cores are more energy efficient than large ones. And so somebody has the bright idea of putting clusters of CPUs. Now this has gone absolutely berserk at the moment because typically inside your smartphone today you will have 10 or so main processors, A-class processors. We'll come back to what that means in a moment. But these are big CPUs with caches and memory management and they're operating in clusters because if you operate them in clusters, A, a small processor is more energy efficient than, than one large one. B, you can turn off the ones that are not in use when you don't want to use them. Now that's pretty revolutionary. So somebody like Intel who are talking about making the biggest most powerful processor available doesn't have that as an option because they don't think that way. They think about how do I get the maximum number of MIPS in the box. ARM is thinking about power. Most of the time you've got this thing in a smartphone it's not actually being used. Most of the time it's just sitting there waiting for some email to come in. You can, if you can turn off three of your processors then you're saving energy, irrespective of how high performance that, that particular item is. Now, there's some issues of making sure that the data is consistent, and there turns out to be some issues about how you make it invisible to the software. And so the initial software was very clunk clunky, but within a year it had become virtualized, and the whole interface to the, to the multiprocessor uh, domain has taken off. The uh, partners loved it. Uh, as soon as the software was, uh, w was sensible, then other things came out of it, including the big little uh, concept, which if you don't know it, uh, it's probably the wrong time for me to try and explain it. Uh, but it's, uh, the idea is that you don't actually have to have the same processing power in each one of these. You can have one which is optimized for performance, and you can have one which is optimized for power efficiency. And then you can ramp down to the one which is, uh, which is the most power efficient implementation as well. So big little, uh, you can look that one up on the date sheets, it is interesting. <coughs> now actually 2005 we started working with Manchester on Spinnaker. That's the earlier comments about Spinnaker. Uh, well in fact we weren't working with them but what we were is becoming a research partner and the reason that this is significant was it was ARM's first real university research partnership because we actually had to part with something and that was parting with IP. We'd become rather neurotic about this IP in the meantime and we weren't going to give it to anybody but we, we made an exception and there were reasons for this, at least part of which was that uh, Steve Ferber was actually one of the almost founders of ARM. He was, one of the, he was the architect behind the ARM CPU, the ARMRIS CPU, uh, when he was in ACORN but when the spin-off happened Steve decided he was going to go uh, and be a prof in Manchester University. 2005 turns out to have been a fairly busy year because the other thing that happened in 2005 was that um, we decided that actually trying to do this all in one design was just impossible because the market was becoming too diverse. So you had a requirement for small simple embedded processes for use in toasters and then you had some uh, market for higher performance general purpose processes for use in semi-desktop type applications and some 
you know, smarter phones, not smartphones. And also there's a need for um, high performance, but without the memory management and the caches for things like uh, engine management units and anti-lock braking systems. And it was, wait it was waiting to be spread up this way, A, R, M. You know, that's, you know, our name was, had this in mind and it took us all those years to work out that it was there. Anyway, 2006, um, Robin Saxby, who'd been behind the company for these 15 years, um, decided he was going to hand over the reins to Warren East. Now, we're 15 years into the company at this point. Um, the world is a little bit concerned that, uh, that Robin Saxby is actually on and that when Robin goes away, that uh, this, this energy will also go with it and arm will cease. And surprisingly, the world didn't end. In fact, it hardly hiccuped. Warren is a good guy. He's an engineer. Both of these are engineers. Warren's an engineer who moved into marketing. He joined Arm in marketing and then grew up through marketing and sales in Arm uh, to become the CEO. And Warren, uh, sorry, uh, Robin was an engineer, becoming a marketeer, becoming a salesman, uh, primarily in a company called ES2 before joining Acorn. But these are engineers, and they're engineers on the board. Warren was a different kind of person to Robin. Robin was a driver. He was an initiator. He was a he was a startup man. Warren was a safe pair of hands. Warren was going to consolidate Arm, grow it into that IP business, and he did. Warren is the one that got it in, got Arm back into the FTSE 100 and keeps it there, and it stayed there till the end. <coughs> So 2006, Arm did something pretty novel. It acquired this company called Phalanx in Norway, and uh, having, having had a brief love affair with um, Imagination Technology, interestingly, because they could have been uh, the Imagination GPU that, that uh, got into there, but it went with Phalanx at the end of the day. But this was the first time that we now had a genuine uh, GPU processor uh, in our uh, portfolio, as opposed to having some DSP extensions which existed on the processors before that. The other thing that happened too was we moved to, in 2006, to Eclipse. Now this doesn't seem like a terribly significant point, but what it did was to recognize that ARM's software was an important part of ARM's product. Before that time, we had compilers, we had debuggers, but they were islands. There were difficulty in maintaining them from a the point of view of this wider range of processes that was coming out. It was much more sensible to put it onto a proper uh, footing. And uh, once, of course, you've got the proper footing, then you're able to do extensions, evolutions, modifications, um, uh, maintenance. And the whole development activity just changed from that point of view. Interesting to see that it was only 2007 where the iPhone happened. And the Apple iPhone, again, ARM is already present in GPUs. Um, it is actually present, sorry, in GPUs, in GSM phones. It's also present in the uh, iPod, but I don't rate the iPod as a significant milestone for ARM, that the iPhone is mu much more spe uh, specific. And the real thing was about this is it defined what the smartphone was, and it also established a need for ever more performance in those A-class processors. Now, we had the A-class processors, but we were looking for a customer that was going to drive forward that performance. And this was that, that, this was that customer. This was that market. So it's not just Apple. It's the start of all of the Samsung and everybody else in this world who, who makes their own uh, smartphones, including the Chinese ones at the moment. They're all ARM-based. And they need that A-class level of processor with GPU performance because this is, the this is the product which drives forward that market need. Now, to put some sort of scale in this, we're talking about, at that time, a range of 1,000 to 1 size difference between the smallest ARM processor and the top-end ones which are being produced. Well, in fact, that's a... A, uh, an individual that was 50 million transistors for one of these, and you're talking about using them in clusters, and similarly this is 50 million transistors for a basic Mali, and you're also talking about being able to slot in additional shader cores. So these are very modular designs being made 
which are capable of using the many billions of transistors which are now available to you on the integrated circuit. So those billions of transistors, which otherwise you'd have found a real difficulty using, you're providing an environment in which you can realize the potential of those transistors. So we're now looking at 24 processes in six families. And you're talking about being able to put together systems as complex as this. Look, these are four clusters of quad-core processes. That's 16 ARM A-class processes there. And you've got similar things happening here in the DSP domain. And yet you want to put this system together and configure it, run, setting up you, your operating system, but also your software development tools to enable you to write code to run on this thing, and attach peripherals here, which the user, the customer who's taking this thing, wants to add. He certainly doesn't want to be bothered about all that. He wants to be able to use that. He wants to decide how much of it he needs, take away the things he doesn't need, configure that, please, and I will attach these things to it to make it into my chip to give it the value that I need. And I'll write software on it, and I want to reuse my software. I want as much as possible of what investment I've made so far to be carried forward into the next generation. Uh, so we have all of these partners, around 2,000 partners by now, different grades of partners. Some of them are um, uh, silicon foundries, so pretty well all of the foundries in the world were, were ARM partners. Most of the big system companies are ARM partners, uh, partners being essentially a word associated with licensing. Uh, and then there are people who do designs, uh, and there are people who write software, and all sorts of these people now sign up to ARM as licensee. And it means that when you buy something like a smartphone, you're not just thinking about ARM in the main CPU, and you can already see that we're talking easily 16 processes, 30 processes in there maybe, but you're also going to find ARM in all of these other things too. Because everybody needs a processor in there somewhere. Protocol handling in the Wi-Fi, uh, memory corrections in the memory, uh, sorry, in the memory, SIM security, 32-bit in your smart cards. These are all areas which have got ARM in as well. It also makes it incredibly difficult for Intel to compete, because if Intel changed that, then they have still not made a penetration into those other areas. If you've got a design team at home which is working in two or three areas, then it's got to learn a different architecture and different tools and everything to use Intel. It's so much easier in this domain of multiple chips, and there are typically 20 chips inside a smartphone, incidentally. Then ARM has such a stranglehold on it, it's very difficult. So ARM was pretty well everywhere at that point, but there is still a couple of opportunities. ARM is quite noticeably absent at the top end, and it was also absent in this area, which was at the time called Smart Dust, 2008. The idea being that um, people who had no idea about what a processor was or how to program it or anything else like that would be making things which needed to be smart-ish. And so this thing, Embed, which I'm not going to go blow for blow through, essentially made um, microcontrollers accessible to people who didn't know much about processes. So they didn't need to buy themselves a microcontroller development suite, set themselves up with an electronic lab and uh, scopes and everything else to debug something. They could actually buy this little thing for a couple of quid and they could connect it to their PC via a standard UART cable and use a web-based development environment with some libraries which take everything difficult out of it and you're left with a fairly simple C-like language which you can, you can program it in. And it's turned out to be very, very popular. And the other thing was, of course, it turns out to be what the IoT has now been classed as. So ARM is busily out here designing, uh, providing uh, these tools to help people who have nothing uh, no experience whatsoever about the processes. Will, and the processor part of whatever it is that those products are going to do will not be valued. So it's your thermostats on the wall. It's your network toaster. It's your, um, you know, your auto, the little knob which sets up your hi-fi. It's a, it's a thing which 
just is. When people buy it, they don't buy it at all because of its programmability or its sophisticated technology. They just want a solution. And there's a huge volume in that, of course. Anyway, 2009, we saw Kinect, Project Natal, as Microsoft called it, which was phenomenal, actually, because it was a turning point for ARM in a number of ways. Um, they separated the learning aspects of neural networks, which are complex, from the implementation aspect, which is much, much easier. So they, learnt, they taught a network to recognize all these figures. And I don't know if you've seen this. Much of this isn't really available, but Microsoft publish various background pieces of information about it. And the, um, the, the stick figures that is what they taught. They taught their system to recognize the stick figures. They didn't know how many stick figures it would recognize. They hoped it would do two. It actually does seven. And they could, they could spot the figures who were standing behind, and it would still work out where they were. It was a wonderful example of how, when you teach a uh, neural network, you don't actually know what you're teaching it, and you don't know what it's going to do at the end of the day. But this, the, the implementation was so simple, so simple that they were able to do it in software on an ARM7. So this thing didn't have any special hardware in it. It just had an implementation of an ARM7 CPU with a few peripherals, which one of the other groups in, in Microsoft had created for something else. And it just did it. It ran real time on software, an implementation of the neural network. Now, the thing that, that's interesting from ARM's point of view at that point is we knew that neural networks were going to start to be a big thing in ARM in 2009. Our customers were going to be going that way. So inside ARM, we were presenting to the ARM partners meeting. Um, we're getting signs that, uh, that neural networks are going to be important. Learning networks are going to be important. What do you need us to do to make your life easier? And that is another thing about ARM. You, ARM doesn't know what people are developing. It might have some idea with some people. But generally speaking, the first ARM knows about ARM's technology being used in a product is when it's commercially launched. So ARM has to try and get ahead, to guess ahead, to make sure that the technology that it's providing is going to be the answer to the question that, hasn't yet, uh, that has yet to be asked. And generally speaking, does remarkably well at it, because it does have trusted relationships with quite a lot of, uh, with a lot of people. Now, 2009 saw Spirit formed. This was a, um, an, a, uh, essentially a repackaging, a reuse support initiative aimed specifically at hardware, at objects, hardware objects, but actually led very much to the configuration tools, the hardware and software objects that we talked about. It, it stems from VSIA. It's what VSIA wanted to be. And it's nine years later when it, when it actually, the technology got there, the demand was enough. 2009, I kicked off the ARM External Research Speakers Conference. And Wayne knows about that because he was there. Uh, the idea here was to bring together the academic research community and ARM's research and design engineers together. Moderately successful. This is a, a turning point from my point of view because ARM hadn't realized what research meant at that point. ARM was an exploitation company, and it was exploiting. The role of research as in-feed to, to an exploitation environment, a commercial exploitation environment, hadn't been realized. So ARM was essentially um, capitalizing on the knowledge that it had already imbe embedded, not thinking about the, 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 the need to extend those relationships. Now, it 2016, last year, there was an ARM research summit with Chris Duran now leading it, um, and I think the time is much more right now. We have very much better relationships with, uh, with various UK and European and US universities, uh, still not much in the rest of the world, but uh, the recognition of the role of research had become uh, important, uh, become significant at the, in the intermediate time. Now, Linaro happened in 2010, and Linaro was essentially development of a standard ARM implementation. Before that time, 
implementations were anybody's. Anybody who wanted to do it in a particular way, they could put, put uh, I.O. in any particular area of memory. The interrupt controller worked in any way they wanted it to work. Linaro standardized all that, um, principally by saying what we're going to do is we're going to put Linux up on ARM and we're going to make sure that it's ported very, ready, very readily to any implementations of ARM that follow on from this. Uh, so it created, in its wake, it created a whole bunch of ARM A-class development boards, including Raspberry Pi, BeagleBone, Odroid, but pretty well all of the smartphones. They all conform to the architectural standard which were defined in Linaro. ARM would not have taken off in that, in that environment without that work, and Linaro is still there. <coughs> still doing that thing. Now of course the other corner I said that ARM wasn't present in was the highest performance and ARM partners took, took ARM into high performance servers back in 2011. I'm not pressed by anything at 6 o'clock or anything or any of you because it's now 6 o'clock but if you want to, if you need to go then please do. I shouldn't be very much longer but I'm not very good at timekeeping. Um, the partners took ARM into HPC. As I said earlier, we don't necessarily know what the partners are going to do. And so the first thing that we heard about this was Calixeda had been set up to create a, a, uh, an optimized ARM implementation. And HP had, had uh, obviously been working closely with them because this Moonshot server appeared very quickly uh, with ARM in it. There was the Mont Blanc FP7 project which was set off by Barcelona Compute supercomputers uh, and again they wanted to put ARM into HPC implementations um, and it was this pressure from a partnership which essentially said we've got to do something about this and so ARM started to get um, its HPC act together not that it was a big um, market opportunity, it's just anticipating where the, where the technology is going and when the ETP for HPC was formed uh, in Europe then ARM was a founder of it. Now 2011 saw the ARM V8 architecture 64-bit and this is quite a surprise 64-bit um, architecture suddenly becomes the must-have in smartphones all of a sudden all of the smartphones have to be 64-bit and there's a total race to buy licenses for, our, for the V8 architecture and to re-implement the, uh, the processes that various people have done, so uh, Apple and Samsung and others, uh, all have to switch over to 64-bit, so cash rolls in is a way of looking at it. Uh, it rapidly becomes the must-have in smartphones and, oh, incidentally, the HPC community really love it because that was one of the big criticisms they had was that ARM was only a 32-bit uh, architecture. So the network of stuff, I've said, um, by now ARM is committing to a tick-tock annual process of performance improvement of 25% on its A-class processes every year. That's a huge challenge. But the customers have said they need to have that. They need to produce a marketable difference every year for their product and 25% is just noticeable. So it's got to be at least 25%. And what it turns out to be is one year is a process evolution, next year is a new architecture. So these are big changes. It means that we've got to start turning out uh, you know, really good improvements in process of performance every year. Um, ARM, in the meantime, the world has recognized that IoT is a, is a marketing category. And it's important to put it that way. It's not something that people designed. It's, some, it's a category of things which is now starting to have a market value. And lo and behold, when, you, when people look at that group of things, they find that 90% of them are already powered by ARM. So there's a market out there, and this thing which has been defined as IoT, lo and behold, we find that ARM is already there in 90% of the products which are using it. <coughs> Embed, therefore, so ARM relaunches um, its IoT as a platform, so ARM is now saying boldly, we are an IoT supply company, and the embed platform becomes important for the vehicle for making this happen, and embed is made to be compatible with Kyle, the microcontroller development kit, and the design, uh, suite, number, uh, design suite 5, 
which is the A-class processor. So all of the design tools make sense, including the web-based interface, one for the, uh, for the non-experts. So that's ARM's move into IoT starting. And the other thing it does is it suddenly acquires a whole bunch of companies. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven there, all associated with IoT-related activities. Uh, so ARM is pushing IoT quite hard at the moment. Um, well, and that at least is part of the reason why SoftBank comes along and shows an interest in it. Now, it's, in, it's interesting to think at this particular point, but if you go back to 1970-ish, the only electronics on the block in the computing space was the professional, let's call it supercomputer. We're not talking about many MIPS back here, but the people who were using it were experts. They specified the architecture. It was implemented using state-of-the-art technology, and they used it there afterwards. The users, the market, and everything was in the professional domain. But these subsequent waves in computation which have happened over the years have seen increasing large volumes, and we're talking volumes or we're talking net, uh, um, cumulative cost, it doesn't really matter. These markets are where everybody wants to be. So the development of smaller geometry processes have been on the basis of keeping up with the opportunities of, the, of these waves that have happened successively. Now, IoT happens here when everybody in the world is going to be buying 10 ARM processors every year. Everybody in the world is going to be buying. We're going to be shipping 100 million, 100 billion ARM CPUs every year when you cross that red line. It's a big, big number. Not surprisingly then, whatever technology makes that number possible is the technology that will be used in these markets as well. So it's why ARM is now being considered for the HPC market, because the lead technologies that you can get are being determined by the IoT markets and being determined by the consumer, not the professional. So these guys are the ones who need their thermostats and the technologies which are making the thermostats possible will end up in the high performance machines which the professionals need. So the professionals now, they can architect their system, they can use their system, but they can't choose the technology. The technology is given to them, it's an option. It's a, a non-option. It can be particularly tricky if you want to make high reliability systems, for example, and the small geometry processes are known to be unreliable. You, the, the designer has the challenge of make it happen. <coughs> anyway, 2013, see another change of hands. Warren East hands over to Simon Seegers. Warren's hair gets thinner. Simon has an advantage here. <laughs> he starts off without, without too much. But the mission now is to take ARM to the 100 billion per annum era. Warren, not surprisingly, it's a tiring business leading a company like ARM because these are not... Um, figurehead posts. These guys spend a lot of time on the road talking to everybody. They're always flying somewhere and they're never at home. Uh, and, you know, for credit, they get paid proportionally. These are not the highest paid executives in the whole world. They're paid, you know, substantial amounts of money. But they're damn well earning it, and I don't envy either of them. It takes a lot of energy to go and uh, lead arm into what's going to be the 100 billion era. Simon is another engineer. This guy joined from Manchester University as a design engineer and has grown up through the ranks. Arm is an engineering company led by a dream and it's worth remembering that somewhere along the line. Um, anyway, about this time, 2014, I gave a talk in the Arm General Engineering Conference to clarify the role of research relative to Arm. And uh, eventually, because it's one of those things where you've been trying to pass this message over for years, and you've never managed to either say it in the right way or people haven't heard it in the way that you said it or anything like that. But eventually the message got through. The new chairman, a guy called Stuart Chambers, called me in. He said, that thing that you were telling about in the, in the meeting, can you tell me about it, please? Clarify it. I want to understand it. A year later, the R&D group reorganizes, remodels itself into the research group. Clear mandate of responsibilities to the development groups and immediately upscales. That was an important message, but ARM research from 2015, that's only two years ago, is now recognizes the role of research and the importance of research to its continuing business. That's the link to you guys. 
ARM architecture moves into HPC, you've probably seen the press, Fujitsu, European Commission, even EPSERC has its piece. ARM is being pushed into HPC. Um, there is a support activity. ARM has introduced the SVE, scalable, scalable vector extensions, in the ARM V8 architecture. Um, ARM has effectively formalized what those interfaces are going to be, but it's not implemented it. It's left the implementation to people who are going to build the HPC systems. <coughs> so there are people out there making chips right now ready for those systems. I can't tell you who they are. I, don't, I know some of them. It would be uh, more than my job's worth ha, to, uh, to disclose any more than that. But nevertheless, ARM has spent some time compilers, debuggers, profiling tools, operating systems, anticipating now that there is going to be a market here that needs these things. It acquires um, Alinea towards the end of uh, last year, just about the time I was leaving, and their HPC debugging software company. And uh, the what else have we got to say? I mean, ARM is putting in the effort into that area because ARM's customers want to go there. That brings us pretty well up to date, uh, except for the SoftBank thing. So, uh, 18th of July, SoftBank agrees terms with ARM Exec for the ex uh, acquisition of ARM. A £17 a share, which is a 43% uh, uplift on the current market value. It valued ARM at £24.3 billion. Specifically interested in the development of the possibilities of ARM. Let's, you know, not messing about. They're interested in the IoT possibilities here. It's not that they're finishing with the others. They're interested in all the rest of it, but the opportunity is in the IoT space. Commitment to keep the UK, keep the headquarters in the UK and to double the UK staff in the next five years and to grow the rest of the world. Keen to maintain the business model, the culture and the brand. It took them six weeks to clear that, that's all. Six weeks later, they reached into their pockets and they produced actually 24.3, and that's nine O's after that, of pounds, real pounds. And they gave it to ARMS investors. And ARMS investors, since the IPO, have been all around the world. So ARM isn't a UK company that this 24 billion uh, investment company has bought. ARM wasn't hasn't been a UK company since whenever the uh, listing date was, I can't remember it now. Um, but when it did its IPO, ARM became owned by its investors. This move changes the set of investors, but they're still international investors. And incidentally, these guys are an investment bank. They are there to invest. They, do, they have no technical objectives. Their primary interest is making money somewhere down the road. So it's worth looking at ARM pre to SoftBank, just what was it? Last published revenue is 150 million per year. Um, R&D and uh, profit before tax, about the same. A billion dollars in the bank. ARM had a billion dollars in the bank, at 1%. Uh, 4,000 heads, 22 offices, still 10 countries, 1,700-ish in the UK. This is the number that has to double. Headquartered in England, shipping processes at a rate of 20 billion per annum. So that's where it was. We're going to go up to the 100 billion in the next couple of years. Uh, but the total of 100 billion shipped to date was achieved in February in 17. Now, to put a scale on that, that's broadly speaking 10 times the heads, realizing 50 times the revenue, achieving a thousand times the value, the corporate value, in 1998, or the IPO, 2008, 2018, 20 years. That's not bad. Now, I think that, that if you think of it in productivity terms, that's 10 times the heads achieving a thousand times the, the, the value of the company, which is pretty good. Even 50 times for the revenue is pretty damn impressive, actually. It's done that um, by effectively evolving a simple technology mission. The technology mission, which was believed by the staff, was propagated inside the company, was to make stuff which was going to make our partners' life easier. It had partners, not customers. It was a sharing relationship, and that was very important, actually. 
because if we were going to provide the technology that they needed, we need to, needed to have as much view, advanced view, about the sort of things that they were going into. That relationship was very special because we did know some of the products that some of the, some of the uh, big companies were developing ahead of the market. Um, Arm has been responsive, it's been listening very closely to partners, but it's not been setting the agenda. Um, it, it was as big as it needed to be at any stage, but it wasn't bigger than it needed to be. It grew organically, it was financially cautious, it was owned by international investors since 98. Its board was independent, the chairman represents the director's investment, and it's been guided by a dream and culture. I've got two more slides to go. <clears throat> so as a soft bank company then, effectively one day later, it's still international investors who own it. But now 50% of the board is made up of soft bank people. So they have a very much bigger influence than the previous investors. So that might mean that they don't quite like the way ARM is going and that technical body who was originally leading ARM hasn't got the, the whole 100% lead that they once had. Uh, they have declared this special interest in IoT. It could get in the way. Um, they are interested in financial returns somewhere and technology is just a way of getting there. It's a, a useful tool and it's tolerated as a means to that end but the main purpose is to make money. Uh, money is now not an obstacle. These people have friends with very deep pockets, but we already had a billion pounds in the bank, so we weren't short of money either. Um, but now, to do the growth which is anticipated, Arm will have to change its culture. It's got to go from being a close, responsive listener to actually setting the agenda, and that might be quite a change for Arm to do. So it's legally bound by the Mon Monopolies and Mergers Commission to double in size before 2021 in the UK, which essentially means recruiting around 500 new people a year for the next two to three years. That's a lot of recruiting. The current level is about 100 a year. That's in the UK. So grow anywhere else it likes, but the Monopolies and Mergers Commission says it's got to double in size by, in size by 2021. So you should see an increasing amount of um, pressure to get good engineers in ARM in the next two or three years. Uh, acquisitions are good ways to build headcount, but they can be dangerous because they bring their own culture with them. And if you want to maintain what ARM is, then maintaining that culture is an important part of doing it. So, my last meaningful slide. Is this too much luck? Everything, every company needs luck. Every activity, every strategy needs luck. I mean, that's a lot of luck. All those milestones over all the years all turned out that Arm was in the right place or took the right decision. There was a lot of key luck, a lot of key milestones in there, and I think that something has got to have been on our side. And I think that this statement by Peter Drucker, culture eats strategy for breakfast, is probably a fundamental one, actually. Um, businesses, established businesses, are run by people who know how to run businesses. They've been to the uh, big, classy business schools, and they've heard all of the, uh, the, the good speakers talking about how to run a business. In many respects, Arm didn't have any of that. Arm had a bunch of engineers led by a dream, and they've been led by that dream, but they're now going to be replaced by people who, who've, known, who've read the books and been there, they've been on the courses. And it could be quite nasty, because um, Arm is a different company, which means that the rules of conventional business certainly aren't going to apply to it. Customers liked and continue to like the risk-sharing business model. And if you combine that with the fact that the employees are all involved in the business with the share allocations and the bonuses, everybody felt that they were involved. Everybody was talking to customers. They were trusted in customer dialogue about important things. Everybody felt that they were working towards this thing. And they, they were working towards it because of their individual value and also because of the corporate value. And the customers also liked it for that relationship as well. It was a shared trust. The license 
investment and the royalty was effectively a shared risk issue. We were going to get money back when their product was successful. This made partners, this whole domain is a domain of partners. The employees are partners and the customers were partners. And that made everybody involved and it made everybody have a share in the success of the customers, uh, the, the end products and the, the activities throughout the life cycle. The other thing that ARM has been really good at is making its own products uncompetitive before its competitors could. And this is effectively the same as don't sit on your cash cows. If you've got something which is successful, then the last thing you want to do is to just sit back and count the money. What you've got to do is to design something which is even better to replace it. Because there is a competitor out there and they want to design something which is better than your something. You can get there first. You're already up and running. You've got a good team. You've got that opportunity. But most people, when they've got something good, they sit back rather than drive forward. And ARM didn't. And it's well to their credit that they didn't. So partnerships up, down, and inside is a winning formula for business. And it's been a winning, winning formula for ARM. And for 2017, I'm afraid that's a new chapter, which doesn't involve me. So thank you for listening, everybody. And... Uh, there we have on.